So when I went to China about two years ago on my book tour, um, I met a, a huge number of wonderful, wonderful people. And the proliferation of anti Falun Gong message that I got from these people was, was um, constant. Um, they talked about gods and they talked about numerology and then they talked about Falun Gong. And so I became interested in Falun Gong. I didn't know very much about it. Um, I saw, you know, they were in the malls all the time handing out flyers. Um, and I did not know at the time that Shen Yun was a part of Falun Gong. So I started looking into it. Um, and I wrote an article that was written in Skept that was published in Skeptic Magazine. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, that in this article. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that article. I'm going to play some recordings and um, see if I can paint a picture for you of this cult. And I didn't know Falun Gong was a cult. I didn't know um, Shen Yun was a cult. Um, but it is, and it's a weird one. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Falun Gong. This is what I dis what I found out, discovered um, in my investigation. So it's really weird. So Falun Gong was um, created by a man named Li Hong Chi, and Li Hong Chi is. A typical charismatic cult leader. Um, he lives with his cult members on a compound in New York and he uh, is always surrounded by people which is not that big of a deal but his idea, the idea of Falun Gong, is that there are aliens. Yes, there are aliens coming to destroy the world. Um, they're going to use interracial marriage as a weakness for America, for, for uh, humanity. Uh, the more interracially we're married, the weaker we are. And uh, they're going to take over the world. And the only way to fight these bad aliens is with Falun Gong and Li Hong Chi, who has so generously um, volunteered uh, with his master superpowers to defend the Earth from the aliens. I'm not making this up. These are the people who were doing stretching in the park. It's about aliens and it's about special powers. And Li Hong Chi has these has this this cult, this Falun Gong, and if you listen to all of his tapes, buy all of his tapes, listen to all of his tapes, and obey all of his rules, you will scale up the ladder. The uh, the the it sounds a little Scientology, but it did, <laughs> probably with a good reason. You'll scale up the ladder, and when you get to the pinnacle, Li Hong Chi will place in your abdomen an undetectable interdimensional wheel. Literally, he will place this into your abdomen. And this wheel gives you magic powers. And it allows you to levitate and heal people. And if you ask Li Hong Chi, he will tell you that many people can levitate and heal people with his magical interdimensional wheel. They just all choose not to ever in front of anybody. He went on record in 1999 alleging that David Copperfield was a, um, a Falun Gong person because he could levitate. He saw him levitate on TV. So he must be levitating with Falun Gong superpowers. Yes, these are the people stretching in the mall. This is the same group. This is the same cult. And as I learned more and more about this, I got really, really fascinated. Um, by this, this, this cult that I never knew existed. I was 
the president of American Atheists for a thousand years. Well, I was the president of American Atheists for eight years, and I worked with, I've been in the movement for 22 years. And I never heard, I never realized that Falun Gong was an actual supernatural cult. Uh, so I started to do some interviews. And um, the interviews were really, really interesting. Uh, I'm going to uh, play some, some interviews for you. Um, so I can, so you can hear what's going on, but so all, I interviewed three different people who had three different experiences with Falun Gong. Well, they were similar experiences. They all went to the compound. Um, they were all offered a job in this orchestra, which included the responsibility to live on the compound, eat their food, practice Falun Gong all day every day um and that, that was the life of the cult member you you practice the tai chi you listen to the lectures and you groveled at li hong chi and you practiced your art and you practiced your orchestra pieces so you live on their compound um and you share like a dormitory style type room with another grown person and you really can't bring much with you. It was very like, you know, simple. Like you're gonna give up all your, all your material possessions kind of vibe, um, and live like a simple life on this compound. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, a kind of almost like a commune vibe, mm -hmm. like a like a hippie commune vibe, except not. <laughs> <laughs> That's except kind of brainwashing. Except brainwashing, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they must have, I imagine, I've never seen it, but imagine the level of like artistry for their acrobats. I mean, I imagine they're good. <laughs> I, they seem to perform all over the place, but mm -hmm. it comes with huge strings attached. Orchestra pieces. So let me just take a step back. Falun Gong is the cult. Shen Yun is the traveling orchestra arm of the cult that generates a ton of money for this cult millions and millions of dollars every year go into this cult and i'll tell you i went to the i went to the shen yin orchestra i'll tell you a little bit about that in a bit but so all three of these people they had the this experience they all said they wanted anonymity they all demanded anonymity because they were all afraid of falun gong Everybody I talked to, three people, all afraid to have their identities released because of because they were afraid of Falun Gong. They didn't say what they were afraid of. They just were afraid. And they told me some seriously, really interesting stories. Um, I think... Uh, the, the the most interesting thing that I got was the um, the racism aspect. Uh, I didn't expect Falun Gong to be racist. I'll get I'm going to probably do another video just on the racism, um, and maybe another one just on the Scientology because this is a pretty deep cult. And they wanted me to actually come to the compound for an audition, a live audition. So around August 2011, I, I went up there, and it was, it was kind of strange because. I went, I, I was picked up from the airport, so I was flying in from Minnesota, I was picked up from the airport, uh, and I guess they had other people in there, but I don't think they were musicians, I think they were just people that were just coming to the compound, and so when I got there, uh, it was some gentleman that I stayed with, I don't remember the gentleman name, but I stayed with this gentleman, and this house that they had, it had like many houses around like the, uh, the compound, just houses off the ground, so I stayed there for a night. I woke up the next morning, and I went to the compound. And when I arrived at the compound, uh, it's pretty interesting because it, it kind of looks like like a modern America, but at the same time, it looks like ancient China. It's very strange. It has the extra dynasty houses, the temples. Like, you are not allowed to go into the temples. Uh, so they have three temples on the ground, and then where the musicians, and I think anyone who stayed there who lived in, uh, I think they lived in like these uh, like Asian houses. They look like Asian houses. Um, mm -hmm. You walk to the door, you have to take off your shoes, uh, I believe. 
and the rooms, there are maybe bunk beds and maybe 12 for every uh, housing room. They did have people who stayed off the compound, but there was a, a strict uh, time you had to be there and a time you had to be off if you lived off, off the, the compound. So the audition, I got in, and so I actually really started September 11th. Uh, so sorry, September 2011th is when I actually started the actual year. So I moved all my things from, from uh, Manhattan, and I went, and I lived there. Now, when it got really strange to me is when I arrived there, and uh, they began wanting to study the principles of Formal Gaffa. And so I, I did some research before I got there to see what it was, and, you know, to see what was the, the actual philosophy uh, of the principles that individuals were, were trying to teach. Uh, so there's pretty much a meditation three times a day, a worship three times a day. So you will wake up at 7 a.m., that would be the first time, and you will usually go eat breakfast at 7, but everyone ate breakfast at the same time. So it will be a, a massive, like, uh, cafeteria where they will serve pretty much uh, Asian cuisine, pretty much rice all the time, uh, some form of meat, maybe it will be pork, it was rare that it was beef. Um, and pretty much that was pretty much the the, the, the serving. It was rice all the time. Like I've never had that much rice in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, I I believe I was telling uh, the partner that you know I saw Master Lee every single day. He he lives there. He lives there. Yes, he lives there. I saw him every single day. It was strange is because when he would walk in the room, all of the, all of the disciples would stand. But I never I never was good. I was like. There's no way I'm going to call somebody master. I'm not an African American man. I'm not going to call anybody that. Right. That's just not going to happen. So, yeah, when he walked in the room, all of the, all of the, you know, the practitioners would stand. Uh, and it was like, it was like weird because he, you know, they, he would, he would come in and I think he would have like a, I don't know if they were like, I don't think they were bodyguards, but it was just people who were with him all the time. The same group of two or three people who were all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and people were like, you know, like, I don't know, it was like strange. And if you think about any movie when the master walks in, the benevolent spirit, how people were acting, that's, that's what it looks like. It was something I've never experienced before. I just, yeah. It, it, always felt, it felt cultish, you know, you think about all the cults that you have in America, from the David Koresh, uh, yeah. the individuals out in California with the uh, Indonesian people, I can't think of the cults. But, uh, and they yeah, the like and I, Yeah, and then... I think for me, the reason why I walked away is because it got into like some interesting conversations about, you know, me teaching music and uh, Master Lee felt that music, any music that was made after after 1800 was unpure. It was music that should be banned and abolished. So pretty much all the music I was able to teach was music roughly up to maybe like the death of Mozart. Anything past Mozart was unspeakable music. He believed that... Um, he believes that anybody who was born out of interracial marriage uh, is an abomination. Uh, he believes that anything of dark, dark hue or dark skin is also an abomination. And so and when I heard that comment, I think I was like, yep, that's my exit. So, so I think that I was the only black person. And all the videos I watched with them, you know, lectures, it was never, you would never see anybody of dark hue in any of the videos or any. He, I mean, in his lectures, he talked about this. In his writings, it says anybody of uh, born interracial marriage is an, an abomination to society. Why? Wow. And, 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 and anybody with dark skin. Anybody with dark skin, yes. And he, he, his analogy was if you take a white piece of paper and an ink spills on it, then this paper is stained. And then he's he, the now he described the humanity in life that when you add darkness to anything, it is destroyed. It is the wickedness. This is big. It's international. Nobody's talking about it. Most of the cult organizations don't list them as a cult. But there is a big cult. And and what I realized, you know, a lot of people say, oh, um, these people are persecuted by the Chinese government. The Chinese government persecutes Falun Gong, 
And Falun Gong alleges that there are organ donation banks that they're just, that the Chinese government is just uh, going up to all of these Falun Gong practitioners and hoarding them up and then just taking their organs, killing them, taking their organs and selling them. Uh, that's not what's happening. It doesn't appear to be what's happening. Um, there is some evidence that there's some stuff like that happening, but it's not happening exclusively to Falun Gong. Um, and it's not happening exclusively in China. Um, to the extent that I've done the research, I have not seen any evidence that the Chinese government is just doing this with Falun Gong. Um, but if you talk to Falun Gong, you'd say it was a war between the Chinese government and Falun Gong. And, uh, and uh, it, it's just so interesting that in, in Shen Yun, when you see Shen Yun, I went to go see Shen Yun, and uh, it's, it's nothing but a huge propaganda tool. It's anti-Chinese government pro Falun Gong. That's what Shen Yun is. It's a propaganda money-making tool. You spend 200 plus dollars for the cheap seats and you go see dance moves, beautiful dance moves, good music, um, nothing spectacular, but nice. Uh, but in between the dance moves, there's a story, there's a story uh, about the Chinese persecution of the poor people of Falun Gong. I'll give you an example. This is part of the Shen Yun, which is the arm of Falun Gong story. This is part of the Shen Yun show. There's a man and his girlfriend, and they are in love, and they love Falun Gong and they are in love with each other, and they go into the park, and they practice Falun Gong. And then the evil Chinese government comes up and says, you cannot practice Falun Gong here. And they say, oh, I love Falun Gong. Falun Gong is good. I'm going to practice Falun Gong in the park, which of course is just Tai Chi, except for all the teachings and the madness. So they're in the park doing Tai Chi, these, these Falun Gong moves. And the Chinese government says, no, you cannot practice Falun Gong here. Falun Gong is bad. And so they take the hero and they gouge out his eyes and they throw him in jail. And then, through the power of Falun Gong, the hero escapes the prison and grows his eyes back and gets the girl. <coughs> and at the end of the show, there's this huge tidal wave coming to swallow the world. And Li Hongqi walks out on stage and puts up his arms and the tidal wave goes away. Magic. And so I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm trying to figure out why they're doing this and it's all about this persecution complex that they're pushing this guilt thing that they're pushing they are trying their, their target market of course is people left of center because people left of center have white guilt and they're targeting that white guilt and saying oh look at us poor um people all we want to do is practice falun gong is, is stretch in the park all we want to do is stretch in the park. And the evil Chinese government, and of course Americans, they don't really understand. They, they don't really just, they don't know much about the Chinese government. It's very easy to demonize the Chinese government because the Chinese government can be, legitimate, can be legitimately pretty fucked up sometimes. Um, it's very easy to be, to, to be very sympathetic to this cult and give them money and tell all the people to go to preserve this cult, this racist Scientology-like cult, so that they can make more money, so that Li Hongqi can make more money. And these people live well. They live very well. There's, there's, there's millions of dollars in Li Hongqi's bank accounts, millions and millions of dollars, according to one report I read.
This is a money-making, really awful cult. And here's another thing. When I was in China, guess what I saw? I saw people stretching in the park. People in China do Tai Chi and stretching and all those exercises in public all the time. So why is, Shen Shen, why is Falun Gong being persecuted? There's all sorts of religions in China now. Islam is there, Christianity is there, other cults are there. Why is Falun Gong being singled out? Well, number one, it's probably not being singled out because it's Falun Gong. It's probably being singled out because they take action against the Chinese government, like stage large protests and protests against them, against the Chinese government. Oh, I don't know, as if that's okay in China, because it's not. It's communist. It's dictatorial. You don't get to do that in China. If you don't do that in China, you can stretch in the park all you want. If you do that in China, they'll fuck with you. So don't do that. And if you do do that, don't blame, don't, don't pretend you're persecuted when you're actually poking the bear on a regular basis. Uh, and second, and here's the thing, it's not just the Chinese government that hates Falun Gong. It's the Chinese people. I met lots of people who are not affiliated with the Chinese government at all, who really hate Falun Gong because, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. Those interdimensional wheels, they cure you, they heal you. There's a lot of people in China who die because they don't get medical treatment because they're healed by Falun Gong practitioners. A lot, like it's a problem. I used to talk a lot in my Fighting God speech, I used to talk about how the Chinese people are atheists, but they're not skeptics, um, which is why they believe in numerology and horoscopes and all that crap. And they believe in faith healing, and they believe the Falun Gong can, those, that magical, interdimensional, undetectable wheel can, can cure you. And so they die. And so the people get really upset. And uh, I think there is some validity to the idea that the Chinese government is protecting its people from Falun Gong. There's some validity to that. I'm not saying that anybody should have their organs harvested. Please don't take me the wrong way. I'm not saying that anybody should die or anybody should be in prison for expressing themselves. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that the Chinese government and the Chinese people have very good reason to hate Falun Gong. And Falun Gong lives off of that hate. Falun Gong stokes that hate so that they can come here to America and Canada and other places around the world and claim persecution. Claim that it's all about them because all they want to do is stretch in the park. And uh, yeah, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. So when we're so when you see these people, the, this, this when you see Shen Yun come around, keep walking. Um, there are lots of Chinese arts and acrobatic things that are out there that don't support cults. Um, the Chinese acrobats uh, don't. They're not a cult. Falun Gong is a cult. Shen Yun is a cult. And when you pay those exorbitant tickets. Those, that money is not going to the orchestra and it's not going to the dancers. It's going to the cult leader who dictates when his people wake up, when they go to sleep, when they exercise, when they eat, and when they practice every day, all day, from the compound that they have and own in New York. This is today's Falun Gong. This is Falun Gong. And, uh, it's pretty distasteful that I spent $200 of my own money giving it to them. So, I mean, yeah, I had to do this video and I had to do the, read the article in Skeptic Magazine, but whew, that's a real, there's some real cult going on here. 